Um, today's, as I said, normally my talks are on energy or environmental economics, but today is a little bit special uh, because I'm um, going to talk. About, oh God, above! I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> I'm sorry, I got messed up. Uh, so. Yes, yeah, so, okay, we'll do it. Oh, let's start again. Sorry. Uh, got messed up with this is an old, old system. Um, so, we'll talk about Trumponomics. And it's not a political talk or it's not a law talk, anything. It's economics. Because it's not going to praise them or it's not going to bash them. Okay, you can get that all over the internet. Okay, so to make it easy, because economics is the dismal science. Okay, it makes people fall asleep. So to make it a bit more interesting, we'll have a smiley face for when Trump's policies are good for the American economy, and we'll have a sad face when they're not. Okay, it should make it a little bit more interesting. And here is the man himself. Okay, this. Uh, a lot of people will know Trump, and it's not often a person deserves their own economics word, but Trump definitely does because his plans are going to make America great, according to himself, okay? As I said, there will be no bashing or anything like that. It's just taking his economics um, ideas and putting them into reality because he has got a lot of hype in America right now with people thinking some of his ideas are great and some people thinking they're terrible, okay? So, I'm just going to cover five main topics. Uh, the lovers and the haters. And Trump has lots of these, okay? Lots and lots of these. And some people love Trump and some people hate him. Um, and that's the way of politics. Uh, defaulting or renegotiating of US debt. This is a new one of his economic policies he has stated. Okay, so this is basically the US has so much debt and he's going to renegotiate it or default on it. Uh, this is an interesting one <laughs> for where we are. Uh, this is bringing back jobs from China, okay? So Trump is a big lot of that when China joined the WTO in late 2001, 2002, a lot of jobs shifted from America to China and a lot of Americans lost their jobs. So Trump has this, we bring our jobs back from China, okay? And deporting 11 million illegals. This is another one of his uh, proposals that he's going to deport all the illegals in America. Okay. Now again, I want to remind you, it's an economic talk. So whether you think of the humanities or legality, it's not that. It's just economics. Okay. And the final one is the wall. And this is what made Trump um, known to the world when he came out. And he was going to build a big wall. Okay. So the Chinese built a great wall and. Khrushchev built a great wall in the 60s, and now Trump is going to build a great wall, okay? Before I start, what makes it interesting is, I can't vote for the man, I'm not American, but I'm a European who works for an American university in China. <laughs> <laughs> the, world, the world is a big, big place. It's not as small as we can do these simple things. It's not like the 60s, okay? It's very, very different. Okay, so, here in the, um, this will keep it easy, I'll put this slide up and up again. And the first one is Trump's economic view. So obviously, no surprise, Trump thinks all his ideas are excellent. <laughs> okay, everyone. And to be fair, a lot of Americans think these are all great ideas. Or some Americans may think some ideas are great, some ideas are bad. And in the far column, as we go along, I'll start putting in um, extra ones as we go along. Okay, here we go. The lovers and the haters. And this picture for me is awesome because this man here, to wear a, a onesie outfit like that and go on public TV, you have to have love. There can't be any other emotion for that. To, uh, we see it everywhere. You see love in in strange forms, and to go on public TV and do that uh, is amazing. So this man truly loves Donald Trump. This lady, not so much. She has strong feelings, but not, not in the same regard, okay? But what is interesting here, these two people do have something in common, okay? 
They're all consumers. They all spend money. Now, in reality, this is the problem in America since 08. They're having trouble getting American consumers to spend, to spend money. It's, it's a slow, slow process. They're getting hard. This is what's interesting about Trump. Whether you love him or hate him, he is actually causing millions of dollars to be spent on a man buying that uniform or a lady buying all these clothes. Okay? It is actually money in the economy. You have to give credit where it's due. It's an economic talk. It does bring money in the economy and stimulate the economy. So Trump is starting off on a good, good note here. Okay? So he's got one, one thumbs up already. Now, the second one we'll move on to is defaulting on U.S. debt, okay? Defaulting on U.S. debt is where the U.S. is, like every country, they've borrowed so much money and he's basically going to default or else renegotiate, but he's not going to pay what he's paying, okay? Now, this was <laughs> Janet Yellen's face when she heard it, okay? <laughs> if you can't remember who Janet Yellen is, she's the head of the chairperson of the Federal Reserve, okay? The Central Bank of America. And this woman does not have a lot of facial expressions. I scroll the internet. And this is the most shocked look I could find. Okay? <laughs> but this is what I can imagine any macroeconomist talk when Trump said we're going to default on American debt. And again, a lot of Trump's policies are interesting. They seem they seem like a fairy tale. They seem good. Okay? They seem like they seem like an Iron Man. Captain America, they seem exciting. Yeah, we can do it. And here's some of the reasons. U.S. national debt is 19 trillion, okay? Which, the U.S. economy is a big economy. It's every country has debt. However, U.S. GDP is 17.5 trillion, okay? So the U.S. owe more than their current GDP. This is what's interesting. If the U.S. was a home, it would be a negative equity. Okay? Negative equity. Now, basically, it's like having a subprime. And that did not work too well in a way. It did not have a great successful ending. So you can see, the national debt in the US is a major issue. They have to do something about it, okay? But, the, and at the end, I'll explain some ways to do it. Saying you're going to default on debt, that's what Greece tried. And look at Greece now, okay? The US pay about 2% interest, 3% interest when they borrow billions of dollars. Greece pays 14%. And they cannot get money unless the ECB give it to them. Okay? The same way, what allows the US to be a strong economy with such a high GDP to debt ratio, with having more debt than GDP, is Linder see it as a one horse race. Okay? When I was um, doing macroeconomics first, when you talked about the U.S., lending money to the U.S. was like backing a one-horse, okay? Backing a horse in a one-horse race. Unless the horse died, you were going to get your money back, okay? And the only way, if the horse dies, if you want to talk about it, it would be like World War III. So, who cares? You're not going to worry about your money. This is why America can get so much money. So, if you start to default, you're not going to get money as, as well as you did interest rates will go up. And here's the problem. This is what's interesting. Actually defaulting or renegotiating is not going to s shrink the debt. It's going to push it up. Because now you have to pay more interest on your loans, which means now you have more money going out of the country to pay for what you have to pay for, okay? So on that note, I'm afraid Trump gets his first sad face, okay? It's not, it's not a solid economic policy. It's, it, it, it sounds very good, and this is what's interesting. Trump, in fairness to him, Trump is a very, very good businessman. No one can say he's not. He's worked billions, anywhere from you know, 10 to 2 or 5, whatever he says. But he's worked billions, and he lost some money, and he came back. So he is a very, very good business person. And he's using this. He was a very good business person. His businesses went down, and he had to renegotiate his debt. And he got millions wiped off his debt, and then he could continue. Now, in the same regard, Trump went to a very, very good, prestigious U.S. university. He went to the Wharton Business School. Okay, it's one of the top. It's actually, it's business graduates 
MBAs, if you want to get an MBA, you are the highest paid graduates in America. Okay? It's the place to go. However, I feel when Trump went there, he went and he did microeconomics courses. And he goes, eh, I don't need micro. It's like just micro but bigger. Okay? It's not. There's a reason we have a micro school and a macro school. Okay? Trump works at the business level, which is the micro level. And you're dealing with lots of businesses. Not paying your debt is fine, because you can go another way. Being president of the US, that's a macro level job. It's a totally different economic beast. And to be very good at one does not make you good at the other. And while Trump is applying it, he was good at business, he renegotiated. Fair enough, Trump is a good businessman. But that does not make you a good macro economist or president or someone who can deal with the macro economy. They're two very, very different issues. And this is really something he should get some professionals about. That's uh, default, what's the next? Bring jobs back from China. So this is an interesting one, considering I'm in China right now working. And I would just like to say, so that means all us in Missouri State, China campuses have to go back. But if we are going back, could you send us to California or New York? <laughs> I don't want to go to Missouri. It's fine. <laughs> I'd rather California than New York, Chicago. Okay, if you are going to bring us back. Uh, and I'm not the only one. Uh, <laughs> if you insist on it. Okay, so again, the thing with bringing jobs back from China, you have to understand, it's hard in China to understand right now. America suffered a huge economic crash in 08. People lost their jobs, and then they seen China was getting bigger, and a lot of jobs went to China. So if you're a hardworking American, it's obviously if someone is telling you, we're going to take all these jobs back from China. Yeah, no, all the jobs back. You go, this is awesome. I'm going to have my job back again. But again, it, it sounds wonderful, and it's like, a, it's like TV. It's like, it sounds very good. It's a movie. It's a nice script. But what jobs do we bring back? So, you imagine these kind of jobs, high-end. Apple is a good name. You know, Apple of all their, so bring back high-end tech jobs in America. But why stop there? Why not bring these jobs back as well? Get America making this. And if we are going to take a step back for America and bring old jobs that we lost, we might as well continue and go back to the good old days. Okay? It, it, there's no, what, where do you stop if you're bringing these jobs back? America lost these jobs because they were not cost competitive, okay? It's not that China suddenly became very good at making something. It's, it's economics. It's China was cheaper. And companies are profit maximizers. As Trump knows from a macro, from a macro perspective, companies are profit maximizers. They will move to the greatest area. If you, if you bring jobs back, from China, this is not a step forward for America, okay? This is a step backwards. Because the point is, China lost these jobs, or sorry, America lost these jobs because wages were too expensive, labor is the usual. So what you're saying to Americans is, what we're going to do is something you were good at 15, 20 years ago, we're going to do that, and now you can do it again. That, no economy in history has ever done that. You don't, you don't bring it back. What they should be doing, and any presidential candidate should be saying is, no, America is going to make something China cannot make. We're going to make high end, we're going to move up the value chain. What's interesting about this fact is, though, China is suffering the same thing right now. China is losing jobs, traditional jobs that China had in the 80s, 90s, to Vietnam, India, Bangladesh. But you don't have the Chinese going, oh no, we're taking all those back. We don't want to lose those jobs, bring them back. China is moving up the value chain. The same thing America did in the 70s, 80s, 90s. And for some reason, we're being told now, no, we don't want to move up the value chain. Best case, we want to move sideways or really down. Okay? It's, it doesn't help America to bring back old jobs. It's not good economic policy in, in any regard. And it can only have one outcome. Okay? Again, it sounds great, and you have to imagine, put yourself in the place of an American who's lost a job. You've lost your job, which is terrible, but you bring these, back, these jobs back from China, okay? Now, in reality, a Chinese person is working at probably $4 an hour, approximately, to work in factories, these kind of jobs. $4 an hour. 
That means an American has to work at $4 an hour to do that, which is below the wage. Or okay, you know, Americans won't do that. So what happens then is when you go to Walmart to buy these electronic equipments or home base, anyway, you have to go now because you have to pay American wages. That stuff is going to go up twice, three times. Prices for products are going to go up and up if you bring them back to America. And when prices go up, inflation. That's all we're going to have, okay? What's interesting about this is, and this is important, remember it sounds like a great idea, but in reality, this equates to raising taxes on hardworking Americans. That's all it does. Because if you have $100 today, you can buy, if that's only can buy you 90 worth of stuff next year. That means you lost $10. That's the same as the government going, we're hiking taxes $10, okay? So you bring the jobs back, but now you have less money, okay? Prices go up, this leaves less money in their pockets, okay? Again, not so good. It's a, it's a bad economic system, okay? It, does, it doesn't work, and in all fairness, and most people are, are anti-taxes, the government, Trump would be better off if he said, what we're going to do is we're going to actually charge you, we're going to raise the tax base. We're going to use that money to invest in American startups. Keep jobs in America. That would be a far better economic benefit than this idea of taking a step backwards and getting these old jobs we used to do. It doesn't, it doesn't benefit. Uh, the next one. Deporting 11 million people. And this is something that has, again, I have to keep saying it, it's an economic talk, okay? Whether you agree or not, but this has been very divisive in America, okay? And you can, no more, it's all about jobs. And Americans are suffering from jobs. When you Game of Thrones fan, this is awesome. Whoever came up with this, they should get a medal. This is cool. And this is what Trump feels about building his wall, stopping these illegals coming. Which again, sounds good. We've got 11 million illegals and they're taking American jobs, American taxpayers, American um, um, citizens, stuff like that. They're taking these jobs. But this is the reality. This is the illegals at work, okay? This is what they're doing. They're out working hard. These are not coming in and sitting around waiting for government support. They're coming in working on farms, cutting lawns, cleaning houses, okay? They're working, and working very hard, and they're working very low. And this is the reason that fruit and vegetables are inexpensive in the US compared to other countries. Now, an American might go, fruit and vegetables is not that expensive. It is, it is actually very inexpensive in the US compared to other countries, okay? In a purchasing power parity, okay? It's a lot, lot cheaper. Because the input costs are low, okay? The, these guys, it, it depends, you can get the figures anywhere. But they're averaging, people say they make about $5 an hour, okay? So they're making $5 an hour. So if you're buying an orange in California, the labor cost is $5 an hour, which is very, very cheap. Now, if you deport all these illegals, and remember, it's not about the legal, just get, ship them out, easy. You open up all these new jobs, okay? Now the farming, agricultural industry in California, Florida, they need, illegal, they need legal citizens to work. So, how much do you think these American citizens would want per hour to pick fruit? And remember, the legals were saying $5 an hour, okay? So, you, you can imagine telling these bunch of guys, you have to close your apples, no more macro. You're going out to a field to pick strawberries or oranges, okay? And how much money do you want for that? They're not going to be saying a five or even the minimum wage of eight dollars or fifty. You're, you can just imagine. I would assume twenty, twenty-five dollars to get these. Or even better, these ladies. I cannot imagine these young Americans going out to I'm going to pick oranges all day for five dollars. It's not a reality. This is the point. This policy will lead to inflation again. You deport them all, all these jobs that are being done in the American agriculture industry, they now will have to employ Americans. So the price of fruit and vegetables is going to go up at least triple, maybe four times. Okay, because the input costs are going to go up that much. And again, with inflation, high inflation is the same as having a, an increase in taxes. This is what's interesting. 
these two policies specifically, okay, the uh, deporting and um, the previous one, uh, bringing jobs back from China, sorry, bringing jobs back from China and deporting, this is going to cause massive inflation, which for anyone who's old enough in America, it would be the same as the um, oil shock in the 70s, okay, on uh, just a big, big inflation, which is not good for America. So I'm afraid Trump is losing out here, but... He has one last one, which is the wall, and this is my favorite of all. Uh, here we go. <laughs> so, this is Trump's wall. And from listening to Trump, you can imagine this is the kind of wall that he wants to build, okay? Uh, I will give it to Trump. I've been to the Great Wall, as lots of people have. If Trump builds his wall, it will attract tourists. Okay, people will go to see it, and that is money. Okay, that is money in the economy. Remember, you have to give economic credit where it's due. Now, in the same wall, this is what's good, and Mexico is paying, so even better. And he has say, stated Mexico is paying for that wall. Okay, this is actually an excellent idea of a stimulus package for America. Okay, because it's 10 to 20 billion for the wall. Remember, Mexico are paying for it. So Mexico are going to pay for this wall, 10 to 20 billion. It's going to create millions of hours of work for both white collar engineers and blue collar tradesmen, carpenters, steel fixers, and grow the economy. Okay, this is thousands of miles of stretches five, I mean five states. Um, it's going to create a stimulus package that Mexico is going to pay for and create jobs in America, which is badly, badly needed. So it has a this does, this really should get a smiley face. It is, a, even for a macro perspective, it is a great idea. And this guy is super excited about <laughs> this wall. I presume he will get a foreman or at least some important job. Our, when I was doing up this about the wall, I was doing it, I go, yeah, it is actually a good idea. And then I, I looked on the map and seen where it was, and then it hit me that there is one slight problem. That it is a border wall, okay? So, if the Mexicans are going to pay for it, do you not think they might build it on their side of the wall? On, on their side of the border? Which would mean that it would create a stimulus package in New Mexico. And therefore grow the Mexican economy. Now, so I'm afraid, the wall, even though I had a smiley face at the start, when I was more into it, it was a sad face. But, with the wall, the wall hasn't lost everything, okay? Uh, well, sorry, well, yeah, I, talk, I come back to the wall in a second. This is so, this is Trump's reality and the economic reality. Okay, so he, Trump, the economic reality is not so great as Trump's reality. And again, this talk is not about uh, bashing Trump, it's just about saying what's real and what's not. But back to the wall, because it, it deserves a second round. The wall is not all bad news for NAFTA members, okay, that's Mexico, Canada, America. It's actually good for Mexico if they build it in Mexico and pay for it because it's a stimulus package for Mexico. And as well, it'll make up for a slowdown in exports to the US, okay? Because there's actually less illegals going to America over the last two years. So building this wall in Mexico will benefit Mexico, okay? Because it'll create a private, uh, a stimulus in, in Mexico to help that economy grow. Okay, that's... That's Trump's ideas, and it's, it makes it entertaining to see what's happening. And Trump is putting ideas out there that, are good, that are, seem good, and they seem viable, and Hillary is putting out ideas, and so is Sanders. They're all putting them out there. But I just want to comment something from, again, I'm impartial, I can't vote. Just one idea of an economic idea for any presidential candidate in the U.S. to consider, okay? Now here we go. This is a patriotic act that any American can do today, okay? And you can buy one of these, okay? This might seem strange, but electric car, there's lots of reasons for this. It's got, if you buy an electric car, it's not about climate change in America. It's about all the electricity in America is produced from domestic sources. And that's American jobs, okay? That's American jobs that we produce. You're not, if you buy a gas, a combustion engine, that's run on oil, which is mainly imported. That's not American jobs. 
Okay, so that's where it's... Remember, patriotic is not just about going out fighting for your country, it's doing something for your country. As well as that, this is what's interesting. If you buy an American, we'll use Tesla as, the, as, the, as a great example. Tesla is the first successful American startup automobile company in the US in 90 years. And it didn't have to get a bailout like the other ones. If Americans go and a president would say, let's buy electric cars, what will happen is every car company in America will start to make electric vehicles. This will create more jobs in America. And it will create high-end jobs, high-skilled jobs, and jobs that will not go to China because you're at the top of the value chain. Okay? You're not bringing back jobs you lost, you're at the top of the value chain. And at the same time, remember, you're creating jobs in America because you're using electricity, whether it's coal, oil, um, hydro, wind, doesn't matter. It's American made, and it's American jobs. And the same way with this guy, uh, Elon Musk, the guy who's not even American, he's, he's a nationalized a South African. He set up Tesla's car manufacturing in California, and he's setting up this new Gigafactory, which is going to produce batteries. Uh, for the cars and for other stuff in Nevada. And they reckon the Nevada, Nevada state themselves has said this will bring in 100 billion over the lifetime. That's American jobs, remember that. That is not going to China, that's not going to anywhere else. And no presidential candidate has said this is a good idea. Okay? And I don't mean just buying Tesla and just using them as an example. Okay? Because unlike the other car companies in America, Tesla are exporting cars all over the world, not just um, in America. American cars don't sell very well outside of America. And here's the other one. This is a real one why it's patriotic to buy an electric vehicle. Terrorism, we all know who these guys are. Not, not a very friendly bunch of people. You often hear this thing in America where you hear them, let's cut the head of a snake, okay? Where you hear terrorism, they go, we cut the head of a snake, and they cut the head of one, and then they go and cut the head of another. This is the problem with terrorism. I think, you probably can't read that, I think this is the wrong name to be using for a terrorist, okay? This is what we should be calling it, okay? A worm. Because you have to remember, they are very tunnel visioned, and they're surrounded by dirt all day, okay? And in the same way, the trouble, especially with this guy, this guy is interesting, this plan Aryan flat worm. If you cut the head of this guy, he grows two more. That's a fact. That's not, I'm not making that up. That's a fact. This guy, this worm is unbelievable. You can cut this guy straight down the middle, and you come back a few weeks later, and there's two worms. Okay? If you think really about terrorism, what is happening? Since 9-11, it's not like we have any less terrorists. We've got more. So by saying cutting the head of them, it's like, for popular culture, like Captain America and Hydra, when that scene when he goes, you cut the head of one snake, we grow two more. It's the same with terrorists, okay? So, we, we, by buying electric vehicles, you're not supporting these, which I'll explain in a second. But, here's what's cool. How do you kill a worm that can grow two heads? Okay? So, how the heck do you kill something? You can't cut in half, like a snake, or it will grow two heads. You starve of nutrients. Very simple. You, you, if you have that Polarian flatworm, and you cut him in half, and you go, he's dead, and you chuck him away, you come back two weeks later, there's two worms. Okay? And you take him out and just put him somewhere where there's no nutrients, like a desert, he would shrivel up and die. No more worm. Same with terrorists. And this was cool. Napoleon said 200 years ago, an army marches on its stomach. Okay? ISIS has approximately 30,000 stomachs that must be filled every day, okay? Every day they have to, these people have to eat, okay? Now, let's be honest. These people are not making, that's very expensive. You can imagine, you can imagine a, a company that hires 30,000 people. How much does it cost? ISIS is not making its money selling potatoes, okay? That's not where it's getting its money. It's getting its money from oil, okay? There's no... You, there's no way it's not. And you can't say, oh, well, they're not really, they're getting it indirectly. There's a reason you can, you can have that many people feed them and give them military assistance. Now, in the same regard, in all fairness, America gets most of its oil from Canada. 
the majority of it. But it gets it from all over the world. But what I'm saying is here, you switch over to something like an electric vehicle, you're reducing oil, because America is the highest oil demander in the world, you're reducing oil dramatically, which is taking money directly out of ISIS pockets, which is in turn stopping danger to American citizens and American soldiers. Okay, it's a far better system. So that worm, just starve him instead of trying to cut his head off, because he's going to grow two more. And 9-11, if we haven't seen that by now, or haven't learned that since 9-11, you cut the head of one, they're going to grow two more. Okay, and they get worse. As we thought Osama bin Laden was bad, and what ICE is doing is just unbelievable. Okay, there's been nothing like that. This is why it's a patriotic act. This is what's interesting. In 2013, the U.S. spent $388 billion on oil imports. Okay? Back to our trade deficit, and the trade deficit in the U.S., when you have a trade deficit like the U.S., which is approximately $500 billion a year, okay, it goes up, down a little bit. $500 billion, that's the trade deficit. Now, we're saying bring back jobs in China, that cuts down our trade deficit. Get rid of all the illegals, that cuts it. Default on debt, no, that, that doesn't work. How about you, you slow down importing oil, okay? You can imagine if America did not have to import oil, its trade deficit would be down to 200 billion without anything else, okay? And at the same time, American jobs would go up. It's, it's a very simplistic solution. And I showed Tesla earlier. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, I, I want that. The US military, here's the thing. The US military who are upstanding people fighting terrorism they're the largest user of oil in the world, okay? So, by the US military trying to bomb ISIS off the planet, it's like having a weed and you say, I'm going to over-fertilize that and kill it. You're not going to over-fertilize it and kill it, okay? And if you do over-fertilize it enough, you will destroy everything. This is a proposal that a president can actually make, okay? You can only encourage Americans to buy electric cars. But, and this is a bit long, but the US military says that they will buy all automobiles made in America that they use on base as electric vehicles. When the, when the price gets to a certain X dollars, an automobile can go to a certain miles per gallon, okay? So, the continuation, they continue to buy combustion engines, automobiles with a battery. The Mar American military has a budget of 650 billion a year. And they buy lots of vehicles, they need to. But the reality is most of those vehicles never leave base. They just stay in a base and they drive from one. So you can use an electric vehicle. Obviously, if you're in Iraq, you cannot have an electric vehicle going from one. You need a combustion. This is something the Americans could do, the American military could do. If they did something like this where they go, when the price gets to this, we will buy it. That would mean... that all American car companies could now, you know, Chrysler, GM, every car company could start making electric vehicles. Again, this is creating more, this is private stimulus creating more jobs in America and high-end jobs in America. Not taking jobs they lost, top of the pile here. We're talking electric vehicles are at the cutting edge of technology right now. Okay? By doing something like this, we would encourage that. Uh, okay, the conclusion. Uh, electric vehicles in the US, Trump policies, although sound good, will just cause inflation. This is important. Americans need to innovate, okay, not stagnate. And a lot of Trump's policies are stagnation, not innovation, okay. I just gave you one that is innovation. And switching to electric automobiles has multiple economic benefits, okay. It can reduce the American deficit, take a revenue stream away from terrorism, Create an industry funded stimulus package for the economy. America moves up the value chain of manufacturing, not sideways. Make products the world wants to buy. And this is a reality, and Americans have to get used to this. There is no point in going, America makes the greatest cars in the world. Just by saying it doesn't make it true. That's like me saying, I'm six foot five. It doesn't make it true. Okay? You know, I might believe I'm six foot five, but it's not real. By doing this, you can make electric cars. The world is crying out for them. Europe wants them. Okay? 
these will be sold. Create high quality and high paying jobs in America. And this is something that's needed as well. I left out one thing which makes Bernie Sanders very popular with the youth. University fees in America are extremely expensive. Kids are coming out of university crippled with debt. And you want to give them jobs that are low paid. You move up the value chain and you give them jobs that are worth what they pay the university degree for. And in order to do that, you have to be at the top of the value chain. And that's where America needs to get to. And this is what I'm saying. I use Tesla because they're the leaders in it. If the military bought out this, or the government even encouraged it, or a presidential candidate came out and said, let's buy electric vehicles, it's patriotic. And when I get in, I'm going to do this with the military. All these American companies, every one of these, can start research and development, hiring young Americans, college graduates, to make American cars and create jobs in America. Not take jobs back, create new of the best jobs in America. Okay? And finally, this is a, a, a lament for, for America, as someone who's been there several times and I think it's, it is really a, a, a wonderful place, but right now it's a bit troubling with its, it seems to be with the presidential candidates either side, which let's be honest at this stage is going to be Trump and Hillary. And a lot of Americans I seem to talk to, it's not that they really want to vote for one, they just don't really want to vote for the other. Okay? That's not democracy. That's, a, uh, that's like when I got a study. Uh, I could do more fun things. Okay? In the same way, here's, what inter here's what's interesting. Both candidates, the Republican and Democrat candidate this year, are both from New York. Okay? They're both New Yorkers. As Hillary was a senator and um, Trump is from there. And here are two great Americans, presidentials. Okay? These two guys are New Yorkers as well. Now, my thing is, and I like to do sayings, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. This is something that's been played on a lot in America. And speak softly and carry a big stick, where Trump seems to be the opposite. <laughs> he doesn't speak softly. But uh, these were great American leaders. And what is happening with America that you can't have great leaders like this come to the forefront again? And these are from the same state. Uh, Oh, that's it. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions about this, you can just uh, send me an email or ask questions about or anything at all. Okay. Thanks for listening. Yes. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, are there any questions uh, for John? I would just ask you to use the mic if so. One. I don't need a microphone, John. <laughs> I never need a microphone. All right. Just say I can repeat the question. Okay. My 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 question is uh, I I enjoyed hearing about uh, electric vehicles, and one of the things that came to my mind as you were talking about them is uh, a concern that the electric vehicles could be made someplace else. Okay, so that you know that could be uh, kind of the fly in the ointment, as we say, um, about about something like that. Uh, it, living back in the 1960s, our our economy was driven so much by. Uh, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler at that time. All the cars that we made, not just for the United States, but for other countries. And then we saw a very large portion of that go to Japan with Toyota and, and Nissan and, and Honda. Um, so, you know, my, my question is, are there things that America could do to prevent uh, electric vehicles from being built where labor's cheaper. Yeah. Uh, there is, and that's specifically why I say about the military. Because the military is now, the military can go, we can say, we're American made. So the military can go, we will buy these electric vehicles, but they have to be American made. And 
the military buy American made anyway for security reasons. Let's be honest, the US military is not going to buy a Chinese made automobile. It's going to be slightly embarrassing for the American military if they have to do that. So, especially with the US military, that's why I specifically picked him. That is a great, in order for a policy like this to work, you have to go, the trouble with electric vehicles right now is they're seen as for hippies. Okay, people who think, well, there's climate change, we've got to change it. 50% of Americans do not believe in climate change, and 50% do. But it's irrelevant. And that's the trouble with electric vehicles. They're not being looked in the right light. So if you go with the military and say, this is our base, so there's this many millions is going to be bought every year, that means they are bought from America. And currently, when it comes to full electric, the Americans have the best, simply because Tesla, as I mentioned, Tesla. The Japanese have some very good hybrids, Toyota, but it's a hybrid. Americans, right now, they are on the pinnacle of having the best. They are, they are, they are number one with electric vehicles, so they've got a jump start. But again, it comes down to free trade. The thing with uh, Japanese cars is interesting. America wanted to protect its own industry, its car industry, and the car industry in America was the most heavily protected industry. And they were so heavily protected, they did not have to get any better. And hence, they collapsed in fascinating style. By what helped that collapse was the Americans put a, like a tariff on Japanese cars. And so the Japanese could not sell bad cars. The Japanese, in order to get into the American market, had to sell the best cars. And what started to happen was Americans, when they were buying their second, um, a second car, a second-hand car, it was a Japanese car, a third or fourth, because they lasted longer. And that was, that's what things, this thing of putting up tariffs, stopping trade, that's what happens. But it's, it's a risk you take. But right now, and there's other things, uh, I just used one for today, there's other, um, there's other examples I have, but as I said, I picked electric vehicles because America has the best engineers in the world right now. And if they want, let them take advantage of. And again, if America is going to be a great country and a great manufacturing company, why doesn't it prove itself? I, I think America, and it's no insult to Americans, I think America's got a bit soft, as in it was too much of, but we are great, why do we have to try anymore? Do you know, you need to get back to showing why you are great. And having the biggest military in the world does not make you great. Making stuff uh, and being a world leader does. So I think uh, with the electric vehicle, I think that's fine. Okay. Any more? That's it. That's it, Amir? Is that all? Yes, one more real over there. One more. Uh, which one will you choose? Oh, which, I can't choose any. I can't vote at all. No, you are an American. If I was an American, <laughs> go. Uh, as an American, I, uh, I would have to do like some Americans are doing. and. Um, I would not vote for either. I couldn't uh, see myself uh, voting for either. I think, in all fairness, I think Hillary, uh, Bernie Sanders, well, would say Hillary. Hillary is, would be, um, she, has the, she has the political capability. She's just not a likable lady. <laughs> Maybe she's very friendly, but definitely not Trump. I just, uh, even for America, from, from an American perspective, if Trump gets in, I personally think it will be very bad for America because he will get in and he's, Amer a lot of Americans will go, he's going to do this and he's going to make this awesome and he's going to go and he's going to tell the Chinese leader who they don't know his name, that China man, that we're going to do this and after four years Trump will have done nothing and that will hit the American psyche very, very hard. So I would, uh, I definitely wouldn't vote for Trump but maybe uh, uh, if I had to, maybe Hillary. But we have a, in Ireland, we have a terrible leader at the minute anyway, so we can swap him for Trump. It's so bad. But yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Just to wrap it up here. Any other questions? No? no? All right. Um, thank you, John, again, for a very rousing talk.